Ted Novak, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being on with me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So Ted, you are the uh, the CEO and uh, managing partner of Click Studios. Um, I'll give you that kind of an intro, but maybe kind of tell people like, what is that? How'd you start? Tell us about, about the business and what you guys do. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, you know, essentially I co-lead a, a creative digital transformation business with uh, my partner, Derek Nelson. We're based in Chicago. We've got a location in Denver as well, but post pandemic, we're pretty much everywhere yeah. at this point. Um, you know, and the problems that uh, that we solve are typically rooted in organizations that are going through some sort of change, um, or they're looking for someone to help inspire a change so that they can grow. Um, and so you know, that really comes down into all things digital uh, on the public side. It's things such as websites, brand positioning, uh, building apps, that sort of thing. Um, and what we're starting to see a lot more, though, is uh, internal facing applications. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's probably obvious that the, you know, previously digital was thought to be a communication between businesses and their customers or target audiences. And yep. now uh, fueled uh, by the pandemic, although it always existed, uh, is an importance yeah. of how digital is connecting organizations within themselves. And so over the years, a lot of that were technology driven engagements um, that, you know, creativity didn't have a huge space for it. We're seeing that uh, how people are using these applications, what they look like, how they feel, um, yeah, really has sure, a huge sure. impact on the work that they're doing. So that's typically where we operate. That's cool. That's cool. And, and it's funny because our, our, our circles overlap a little bit with what we do. And one of the words that you, you talked about a second ago that I really like was this idea of like companies using you to sort of inspire them about what could be possible. Because I know for us, a lot of it is like, we know we're supposed to be more digital. We're supposed to be more connected, but we're not sure what to do. So I'm curious for you, like, well, like what, what falls into that inspire bucket for you that's like a good story? Yeah, a hundred percent. It can be as complicated as think looking at problems differently. So typically, if you start a any sort of an engagement, um, typically a, a client or customer knows something that they're trying to solve. Um, a very mm -hmm. common one that we'll hear is, "Hey, we need a new intranet, right?" Well, then you yes. get down to, uh, and you know, if you facilitate a lot of conversations about this, you get down to, "Well, what are we really trying to do?" Well, employee engagement. Okay, mm -hmm. well, what is that? mean and at some point uh through you know facilitating sessions and asking these types of questions you get to really understand what is the heart of uh the problem that this organization is trying to solve or sometimes the opportunity yeah and so many engagements that start off with a particular need um can inspire you know larger thought on what are we really trying to accomplish here yeah Interesting. Yeah, that, that's a that's, it's a fun space to be because you're you're doing new things and they they really do need the help. And um, you know, one thing we talk about a lot is you know, you don't run into a company that's going to say, "Hey, let's do less with technology less, next year. Let's you know really dial it down." Everyone's trying to find out better, more ways to to use that. Um, yeah. Well, I wonder. So, so one of the reasons that um uh, that we're talking is um part of like a, I don't know, a mini series on my podcast is talking to people who are, have really exciting, fun uh, music lives, and then also are in business in some way or another. And uh, you mentioned right before we got on the, the base that started all for us, you have a, a base behind you or somewhere in the room that you actually made, you had, were the luthier, crafter, uh, elect, you know, electrician, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and, um, that, that, you know, that got me excited, obviously. And I'm curious, like one of the things that I, I love talking about is, um, like what's your what's your origin story of music and even if you want to squeeze in there how did you first come to start making instruments because that's a pretty fun side <laughs> thing. Yeah, so the I think my origin story of music is uh, um, I, I can simplify it as best as possible. I learned how to read music. I uh, started with piano before I knew how to read English, and I remember when I was a oh, third wow. grader coming home and telling my my mother I said, "Hey, do you know that not everyone plays the piano?" And of course, at the time, I saw that as my, yeah, at the time I saw it as my excuse to say, do I really have to be doing this? Um, yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's as a child, it's another, it's another kind of structure that's, that's put on you. So I got involved in music very early. Uh, I've got uh, an older brother and sister who are always playing piano. I came from kind of a musical family, I guess. And so I didn't know anything else. I just thought that was one of the yeah. things that you did. But from an origin story, I started off uh, with a, I had a piano teacher, uh, Ann Ablin, $6 a lesson. I'd go to her home and her cat would lick wow. you while you're waiting. And, uh, and she was very sure. structured. Um, if, uh, if you played something with the wrong tempo, you got in trouble. Uh, if you play, I shouldn't say you got oh, in yeah. trouble. She was very much in preserving 
uh, teaching the structure to her students, um, which I think is, mm. you know, one part of the art form. Um, yeah. And uh, and during my tenure there, I, I kind of aged out of working with her and was, you know, in the bands, playing trombones. I self-taught guitar. Right. I had the, you know, cool kid alternative rock band to date me uh, from oh, yeah. back then. Um, but then I ended up taking That's a band piano lessons. That's a date you. What? Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Okay, it was that's just modern. getting it was just getting started. Alternative was getting branded. I yeah. think, back then. Yeah. Um, but I returned to piano. Uh, my mother wanted me to take piano lessons again, so that not because I needed them, she put it, but she didn't want me to lose the skill. And so my yeah. second teacher that I had uh, was a guy by name Dan Williams. He was probably a quintessential beatneck looking guy. He had kind of the goatee. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he had a beret, but in my mind, he did. And uh, my first, of course, yeah, yeah. My uh, my first lesson with him, uh, he had me play a, a, a piece from Tchaikovsky and Dante Cantabile. If you Google it, you'll probably know the song. And when I got finished with yeah. the piece, this was my second lesson. The first being an assignment to learn that. He goes, you know what? Yeah. That's not exactly how that goes, but I like how you played it better. And I think that was really an enabler. <laughs> okay. I'd always looked at guitar yeah. and synthesizers as kind of like the fun music and piano as the structured yeah. boring music. Um, and to this day, I play piano sure. every single day. Uh, and it was really a fundamental thing that got me started in every other instrument. Um, for any piano player out there, you get to see every note right in a row. Yeah, and sure. Kinda, yeah. You got to learn different clefs and all those things. So That's great. It's funny. You actually reminded me of a story I hadn't thought about in a long time, which was um, uh, my, my piano teacher uh, when I was a kid, I don't, I don't remember how much it cost. It was good memory if you know six dollars a lesson. But I do remember that I always took the uh, the music as suggestion, and I would I would kind of put my own stuff on it. And and he hated that. So I'm glad you had a good teacher that that liked it. You also remind me when we, when my kids were growing up. My kids are now 14 and 17. When we were growing up. We had so many musicians over and you know bands and that kind of thing that there was a moment when someone like came over for a party, and my youngest son just brought a guitar to him because. In his mind, everyone played something. His prince like, well, I don't actually play these. And it blew his mind. Like, wait, I thought everyone did this kind of stuff. So that's a funny, <laughs> thank you for those memories I hadn't thought about in a long time. Yeah. Um, well, so, so I'm curious. So so part of part of you know that trajectory in your origin story takes you through probably some performance and other things uh, along with the discipline of like reading and understanding music. So one of the things I'm really curious about is what, if anything, um, you know, you feel like when you, you find yourself in a, you know, a business context, whether it's a board meeting or a presentation or sales or something like that, do you ever find yourself going, huh, I wonder if I learned that or I'm better at that because of something that uh, I got from music? Does anything like that come to mind for you? Yeah, I think 100%. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I found, and I've done some retrospective thinking on this lately, which ultimately will get to the, the bass guitar at some point. Um, yeah. But, you know, the first kind of 20 years of my life, I was viewed as the music guy. Um, mm. Hey, are you in a band now? Are you doing this? It was just kind of part of my yeah. personal brand and my story up and through my 20s. And then in my 20s, I thought, well, now I got to go to work and figure this stuff out. And for the next yeah. 20 years, I was kind of the guy who used to be in a band or made music in his, <laughs> you know, in his, uh, his little home studio yeah. just for himself that he thought was cool. And sometime he'd show a friend. Um, and so yeah. when I turned 40, which was a couple of years ago, I, I realized how much of an impact music actually had during those past 20 years and mm -hmm. went on a little bit of a journey. Yeah. Of what is it going to mean for the next 20? So your question was about business. I'll, I'll focus on kind of where it landed. What I realized yeah. is that similar to sports, uh, where, uh, you know, if someone's going to hire someone and they see in their resume that they're, you know, captain of a football or soccer team or head of the cheerleading squad, there's an implication of a couple things. One, teamwork. Two, hard work. Yeah. Uh, three, dedication. And music has a lot of the same elements that I think prepare you for the world. Yeah. I think where it differs from some of those uh, is it also, to me, uh, one of the things that I feel I've identified is it also captures a personality that wants to hmm. do it their own way and be a little bit different. And I can summarize it this way. When I went to high school, there was a term used uh, called a band geek. Have you ever heard that term? Or, yeah. Or, uh, sure, yeah. Or, yeah, right? Have you ever heard the term football geek? You know, it doesn't exist. <laughs> right, yeah. That's, um, no. yeah. And so what I found that's done in an adult club 
is when I meet when I meet somebody else who has gone through that process, I instantly start relating to some of those. Not all my friends play music. Why are you doing this? You know, it wasn't always right. seen as a super yeah. popular thing, even where it was supported. Um, there was yeah. a little bit of, a, of kind of a going against the grain individual achievement. When I started looking at how it impacted my career, the first thing I noticed is my first job out of school, uh, I had a degree in microbiology, so I like learning how things work. And my first job was uh, in asset-backed securities or mortgage-backed securities uh, at a big bank. Okay. Um, natural fit, right? Uh, that's yeah, another perfect. podcast. That's yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can get into how that played out some of the day. However, yeah. where we worked, and I'm banking and you know shirt tucked in and all that stuff, uh, almost hiding the music back a little bit. Uh, revealed mm-hmm. it one day and found out that the then group senior VP, so the boss of the boss of the bosses, uh, a fellow named Russ Goldenberg, great personality, was also a music person. And I noticed huh. that he would stop by my cube. We're really dating. I don't, do they have cubes anymore? Probably. Yep. Uh, would stop by on a daily yeah, basis maybe. to talk music. And I fully yeah. believe that, um, you know, that kind of credential, I guess, unlocked a little bit of a respect that transcended, you know, three yeah. or four levels of bosses that got me into some pretty interesting opportunities in that career, um, such as working abroad, helping think of different ways to use systems. And it was kind of an entry into how I got into Click yeah. as well. You came up some some really interesting stuff. Though. I really like this idea because I, I always think about, you said, um, uh, you said hard work and dedication, but like the emphasis on that the work is hard. And I think that um, for me, someone who's had time in music, there's someone who figured out how to get really good at something. And that means spending a lot of time on something. And it's funny, it, it, it comes to me uh, as like a, like a, just a, a fact of the universe. If you want to get good at something, just put your, your mind to it and put time toward it. And people who have that sort of like closed mindset, like I can never learn guitar. And I'm like, if you start today, in three months, you'll be playing a song. And you've yeah. been saying this for 10 years. You could be really, really good right now. But like, I think that, that, that I like the idea of like, it's a credential that really like quickly communicates to someone that like, oh, maybe actually this someone, they've got something to that. And I, I relate that, I know when I, um, I started the company, I also hid is the right word, hid the music stuff. Uh, Cause I, I, for me, I, I thought people associated with being sort of unprofessional or late, or maybe you show up drunk or something, just really bad connotations. And I had a coach who uh, was listening to me tell stories about the, the clients we had. And we went through it, our five top clients, we all had some kind of music connection that mm-hmm. we got to, but I, I discounted. I thought, well, that wasn't important. Well, it's like, we talked about Les Pauls for 15 minutes. And well, that wasn't important. Well, we talked about the fact that, you know, we both knew this other thing or on a session before. And those things really like connect you. And, you know, in business, it's like, you know, probably like you, you're, you're, you're in a, a conference room and, you know, you're, you're you know, pitching against three other companies that all are smart and all have great portfolios and you connect on some level, you know, uh, and that could be what it was. So and I, I, really, I relate to that a lot. That's really good. I, what, what do you yeah. think about the hard work thing? Tell me, do, dig into that a little bit for me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I'll keep the focus on music since that's a conversation. I'll some sports yeah. back in the day. But if you think about yeah. it, you know, hard work, what are you, what are you trying to achieve as a musician? And I think when you first start off, you're trying to achieve, I want to learn how to play guitar, right? So you learn a couple right. of things about chords. Most people anchor to a song that they want to learn. Because once you have a song, to everyone else yeah. that you get three minutes to show them you play guitar, you might as well be able to play every song there is in the world, right? So a lot of people kind of yep. focus on that. So the first hard work, I think, is on that self-discovery piece, uh, learning, you know, technique, learning how to make the sounds that you want to make, um, but but basically reproducing something that has been done. Yeah. And that takes yep. a lot of hard work. I think the next level then uh, comes into a, a social element. Uh, and a performance element. So as a musician, you could be very successful being a soloist. Someone who knows that you do what you do. People recruit you, come to play at your shows. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we both know some famous bass players that kind of fit into that piece. Uh, but there's that social element where it's no longer just you showing off to your friends a song. It's you working with others uh, to ultimately yeah. produce yeah. a tune. And I think the third thing that then kind of comes into in the hard work is where you transition from looking at, can we make something that we like? Can we have fun doing this? Yeah. To, this is for somebody else. This is a performance. And I think that's one of the biggest impacts that music is, uh, I found 
being a musician has had on me in the business world is a constant focus on does is what I'm saying matter to the other person? Yeah. Uh, am I saying it in a way that is going to resonate with them? Uh, but yeah. that that performance element um, and then that uh, kind of teamwork and collaboration element. Someone I love said that. one time, love uh, that. yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the diversity, I think, plays in there, too. Someone said one time, no one wants to go to uh, uh, see a rock band where it's seven guitar players, you know, all playing the same thing. So the, the conversation element, I think, plays That's in there. So, so maybe I would go see that, to be perfect. Yeah, maybe honest. I would see that. I feel, right. I feel like, yeah, but I, I see where you're going with um, You know what's funny? The, about, about the performance thing, I wonder if this is something that resonates for you. Um, a long time ago, um, I got this idea that, in our world, we'll, we'll create something at the end of a sprint. We'll, we'll show you. We'll do a demo of things, right? And um, I, I attended one, and the, uh, the, main thing I, um, the main thing I took away was this was boring, and these people aren't reading the room. And that the, we, the, the, the best way for me to describe it was this is a performance. Think of it as whether it's music or a play or something like when they show up, like kind of the curtains go up and we've got, you know, whatever it is, 45 minutes to really like do something for them that's valuable for them and is interesting to them. And it really kind of changed how we thought about stuff. And it was like, this is going to be like, really make it so that it's like, it's interesting and engaging. And even things like, like we practice them now, we practice demos, like in a play, for example, if the prop is missing and you have to wait like 30 seconds for the stage manager, to bring the prop on stage and put it there, it ruins the whole magic, right? So it's like, if you have trouble connecting to your dev environment, well, let's work that out in advance. So that when it comes, you hit your mark kind of stuff, you know, yeah. and that stuff, I don't, I don't know if that resonates for you or not, but it made it, uh, I think we have more fun demos as a result of that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I totally agree on that. There is, I think it was Warner Brothers. They had uh, like three golden rules uh, that they used, which was uh, any anything they produced had to uh, educate, enlighten, and entertain. And if you could hit those three things, yeah. that was the best way to not only connect but have some staying power with whatever your message was. And so, I think performance has those elements naturally because you're going on stage to make a bunch mm -hmm. of noise and yeah. people are supposed to dance. Um, but right. I, I think, you know, when I walk into a, a, a pitch room or to present a sprint, I'm not thinking about making the room dancing, or I think we naturally right. aren't thinking of that. Um, but the more, more and more I think about it, like maybe I should. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were humans. We like enjoying things. Yeah. Or so. it's metaphorically dancing. It's like, uh, it really what that, that means is that I'm gay. Because if you're if you're if you can be engaging and they're engaged, then you're delivering something that was like worthwhile spending time on. Otherwise, you could have just emailed a PowerPoint, you know. Um, well, so let me say. So one of the things I think really really humanizes us uh, are the um, kind of the disaster stories that have happened. And I think music performance for me, at least, especially has hilarious moments of things going wrong. Um, and then I think those I learned from. I'm, I'm curious for you. Do you have any in your mind that like are like hilariously bad music stories that then you kind of were able to pluck something valuable out of? <laughs> yeah, I probably have more disaster stories than I have than I have uh, <laughs> uh, positive stories. But I was a I was a singer too growing up, and okay. uh, um, you know whatever the singing troops were in our school and all this stuff. I, I used to say I spent my high school years in tights because I was both in wrestling and in the magical oh, wow. singing group, uh, which you got dressed up in the Renaissance stuff. Uh, yeah. And oddly, they were at the same time of year too. So my wrestling coaches used to sit in the back. They were supportive, but you know, oh, yeah. like this that's watching great. them. <laughs> Um, so I guess, I guess that's embarrassing on its own, uh, yeah. depending on how you look at it. But yeah, uh, I've absolutely stood up. I remember, um, I, I was a trombone player in the jazz band and, uh, I'd like to think it's because of talent, probably the reality is they probably didn't have enough trombone players, but I played in the high school band when I was in junior high. Yeah. And, uh, so it was a big deal for me, right. Especially junior high to high school. That was like the age that the one year age difference there, I think was, maybe maximize in yeah. terms of pressure and, and, and fear. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I, but it, they gave me a solo as uh, in April, April in Paris was, it's a uh, jazz standard. Yeah. And yeah. I got to stand up, jam the solo out, sit down and uh, nailed it every time in rehearsal. And of course the first performance, I cracked the hell out of it. And <laughs> I remember <laughs> just being like, ah, oh, of course. And, uh, yeah. and afterwards, uh, the conductor came up to me, uh, Ross Kellen was his name. And he said, he's like, Hey, you know what? The audience has no idea that what you played wasn't what you meant to play. 
And he then said a famous phrase that I use all the time in the office. He goes, it was close enough for jazz. I go, that's cool. And his message there was, you, you know, we're trying to accomplish something, a performance, something for people to enjoy. In that case, for yeah. my parents to see their, you know, kid do a solo. And we achieved that. Was it exactly what we yeah. thought we were going to do? A little different, but it, it hit the mark. Um, yeah. And so that's... Uh, that's a quote that uh, I've had to make sure people understood what I meant by it, but I use close enough for jazz quite often in the work. It's really great. No, it's, it's so true. And, and a couple of things I hear though, the one is that that lesson that, um, you know, in a lot of things in life, um, people don't know it was a problem or a mistake until you show them with your face, you know? So it's right. like, you know, who's to say I wasn't, you know, that, uh, that note was, you know, my, uh, I went to the Hungarian melodic minor for that one for a moment or whatever, you know, that's, that was my yeah. interpretation, you know, it's up for me to say, <laughs> um, but no, that, that, that's great. I'm wondering, uh, for you, um, kind of looking at maybe the future, you know, like what, what's coming up for, for a click, um, are there things that you're sort of like, uh, are, are do your, do your future and growth plans aligned with anything you think you picked up from music and how you handle, like the, the changing landscape of a business and the market, all that kind of stuff. Like tell me about your, what's looking forward for you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I, I, I think I have an answer uh, uh, for that. And I think it ties, I think it ties to music. So, you know, music is something that uh, does unite human beings. Uh, if you think of any important event, there's music associated with it. In fact, if you look back throughout history, there isn't a single discovered culture, the existence of humans, where music wasn't factored into it. Hmm. And, uh, and you can even look into, and this is where I'm getting on the business side, uh, if you take a look at you know, some of the uh, drum beats or patterns uh, uh, you know, in other continents long ago in history, um, the concepts that we now say you know, a major scale, which is happy, or a minor scale, which is sad. You know, my children watching a Disney show they don't need to know the difference between major and minor to know that, ooh, something bad's going to happen. Right. Or, ooh, something good is going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And where, where I'm going with this is music and business have rules associated with them, specifically in a lot of the work that we do. So UX, user experience, mm -hmm. and UI, there's a bunch of principles. People do things like this. Therefore, we're going to make a screen like that, Right. And there's all sorts of rules yeah. around yeah. that. As a result, by the way, to get, get to business, if you follow the rules too much and exclusively and treat the rules as actual rules to follow versus guidelines, mm -hmm. we all wind up with the same thing. Yeah, We've all heard this in music too. There's a million yeah. Uh, yeah. podcasts on why all pop songs are the same and stuff like that. No one yeah. rips on yeah. blues music for all being the same, but it is uh, uh, because, it, because it's accepted rules. And what I've learned with music yeah. is yeah. the rules aren't the reason people play a certain way. The rules are actually documentation on how people naturally process music and sound and vibration. Ooh, um, okay. So I had a, uh, an incredible opportunity. Um, I spent some time, uh, if you know, Victor Wooten, famous bassist. I think we talked about this at, at one yeah. time. Uh, but I spent some time in one of his camps, which is a story in its own. Part of that was the bass player for Weird Al Yankovic, a guy named Stephen Jay, who I'd never heard of before. And now he's amazing. I just learned his name. Uh, yeah. So he came to visit Weird Al Yankovic, right? Who's actually a tremendous musician, uh, even though he's making yeah. you know funny stuff like that. Um, but he came, he brought his sons, and they did this workshop. And some of this might be a little bit too musical for a second, but... What they did is they were studying the nature between a two-note chord that makes a harmony, right? Okay. And if you look at the wave pattern of that chord, uh, and if you put a beat every time the wave peaks, okay, you can hear a drum beat. So, for example, if I was to record uh, something that goes like this, yeah, and I play a note a couple of pitches higher, it's going to go... Yeah. Right? It's because they're going at different frequencies. Yeah. Well, they were experimenting with this, and Stephen Jay spent a decent amount of time in Africa. He toured Africa uh, when he was younger to kind of discover different kinds of music. He had all these wonderful stories. And he goes to his kids, he goes, hold on a second. You know, they got their computers and their yeah. doing all this analysis. And he comes back with tapes, cassette tapes. So he plays the tapes, and it was unbelievable. They go, 
the beats that we're making off of this weird computer process are identical to some of the drum patterns that he recorded years ago. Really? And what they huh. found is that the drum patterns for funeral marches, if you sped them up and turned them into notes, they were minor chords. And wow. the drum patterns for happy. Hold on, my things, mind like is your, blue. I've got to like reassemble my brain after just blowing like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. still reassembling. It was, it was, it was totally wild. And I'd be happy to share. I've got some pictures and stuff of it and notes cool. on it. But then the the you know the wedding marches and drum beats and stuff like that when you sped them up, uh, were actually mapped to major scales, and That's so right. if there's ever evidence that you know we're wired a certain way, yeah, yeah, um, to process these things, and so. That's a fun thing to think about on music uh, uh, on its own. But let's take a look at you know what's happening in business and technology. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're humans. We come out pretty much the same way. There has been more evolution lately in terms of climates and, and being able to you know breathe better in higher altitudes, hold our breaths longer underwater. But in, in general, we're coming out pretty similar. It's yeah. still, at least to this point. And we take a look at how technology impacts that. You know, we weren't built to receive this much information at the same time. We weren't built to be this optimized. And, uh, but we were built to be human. Yeah. And so that remains to be the common element. And where I try and focus, you know, in terms of the direction of our business, is I know there will be a new trend that comes out on web design. There'll be a new technology at some point that replaces, you know, Salesforce and SharePoint and all, the, all these things. Uh, but the common element is gonna be, you know, some basic, uh, ways that that humans work and think, and yeah. we like, you know, we like feel, feeling fulfilled. We like uh, an experience, mm -hmm. um, and you know, clicking buttons is not an experience necessarily, but it could be if we think about how we're doing that. And so, I think a lot of the rules in UX and UI and and technology and best practices, right? These are all words in your in our industry. Yeah, sure. um, rather treating them like scales and notes, you have to do these things and realizing that those are all rules that were created based on humans, net, how humans naturally behave. Yeah. You really soon find that the more that you focus on the human factor, the better those rules will be, the better the technology will be. And it, it's, God, uh, I, I, I really it's, love that. It's, yeah. It's a great analogy. And one of the things I think that, um, you know, where I thought you were going with it is also that then if you, if you go, if you go with kind of what works, because you know all these all these patterns you know that get established, they they they're patterns because they work. Then the opportunity to put one note outside of the scale or one one surprise now it has impact because it it does feel different, and now you can do it deliberately as opposed to I remember back uh, you know about when the web kind of started that the uh, when patterns are all over the place and people sort of for a little brief period of time sort of value doing weird things with the UX, and you go in and say like, well, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do right now that kind of thing. And we sort of converged on stuff that works after a while. Um, it's really, it's a really the, the the parallel with music is great. That that's a really uh, that's a mind blower. So do do send me whatever that was because I want to I want to learn about that. That's incredible, <laughs> incredible story. Um, yeah, cool. Not so this has well. been a treat. You gave me about ten fantastic ideas. Thanks for sharing it with me, and um, this has been great. <laughs> I think for for chatting with me today. Well, awesome. Well, as, as, I, as I warned you, I think when we were talking, I said, you know what, this might be something you, you, I do a podcast on this as, uh, by the way, I, I, uh, I took that moment, I discovered your podcast for you inviting me on this. Uh, oh, yeah. And I really enjoyed it. I think you do a great job. Uh, great well, job with it. I hope I can deliver uh, to the same that some of your other oh, guests great. have. Oh, that's great. And actually, you reminded me, this would be the first yeah. po podcast with Epilogue. And I think Epilogue should be for those who care to learn about it. May we please see and hear about your custom base. Oh, Absolutely. So COVID, we all had some time on our hands. Yep. Um, see if I can get this whole thing in here. This yep. is maybe the 11th, 11th base that I built. Okay. And I'm a woodworker as well. I like making things. I like creating things from scratch. Honestly, I just like trying to get away. Yeah. From it. Can I figure this out and do that thing too? Sure. And so I started off with uh, building acoustic guitars. I thought it was very interesting. I wanted to learn it comes back to rules again. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at a lot of the different guitars that are out there, there's about four or five different body yeah, styles that it. we all know. Yeah. And we assume that it has to be built that way for it to work. And in fact, none of that's really true. Mm -hmm. The end principle of an instrument is uh, the string is making a vibration. Yeah. Wherever you cut the string off, changes the length, which changes 
the sound wave and, and that vibration yep. pitch that we know. And the rest of an instrument is how do you make that vibration loud? Mm -hmm. And what is it vibrating against? You know, against metal, sure. it's going to sound higher pitched. Against deeper, darker woods, it's going to sound lower and heavier. So if you start playing with those different variables, it becomes a really fun thing. So I started building uh, guitars out of scrap wood. My mm. my neighbors took a, a fence down and I saw this. Oh they God. saw garbage. I saw cedar <laughs> right. um, and started kind of constructing them that way. Uh, I learned the principles of how a guitar is made, but I refused to. I didn't I don't like following instructions either. Um, sure. As always, the Lego set, I dump it out and make my own yep. thing. with yep. it. Yeah. So I really focus on the principles. And then I just everything was an experiment. So this was. I built this one when I when I personally had COVID, which was over the holidays. So this is oh, about man. a one week build, and uh, I I love bass guitar. It's my favorite instrument. Yeah. I built this one to be fretless, and the components are. It's I'm trying to hold it away where you can see it. Yeah. Maybe this is the most interesting yeah. view of it. So it's made out of walnut on the front, and the tree is one that uh, we removed from my parents' yard. It was getting oh, uh, my God. diseased two years ago. And we kind of planked down the wood, and I was like, I'm gonna make guitars from this. I'm gonna play the tree that was in the sure. backyard. Oh my god, that's crazy! It. Yeah, the uh, the back of it is cedar. I can expose my. Yep. I'll explain this mess in a second. Back of it is cedar uh, from stairs that came off of a house uh, in in my folks' neighborhood. The fretboard is a piece of Brazilian walnut flooring, and I have a little oak in here that, believe it or not, so Click Studios is located in the Fine Arts Building. Okay. Um, and which is a lot of different musicians. I guess another part yeah. of the story yeah. when I think about it. And uh, when we moved into the space that we're now in, it used to be a violin cello dealership. Oh, wow. And they left all of their uh, cello stands, which were all made out of oak. Oh, my. So, of course, I dismantled that, brought that home, and said, someday I'll use this. Yeah. So it's kind of a lot of stories in the instrument uh, itself. And my goal with this one is I'm playing around with electronics. Okay. So for acoustics... It's all about capturing vibration against air and yep. giving it a place to release. So that's why the holes are in different sure. places of guitars. That cool f shape hole that you see is actually a lot of physics behind yeah. it. it. squeezes air out harder. Um, well, electrical music, or electronic music, is about picking up the vibration of these strings. And so when you see a pickup on a guitar, what it is a magnetic mag am i going too deep on no, this right. let's take, let's, we're, we're in epilogue land if, if, if you weren't interested you can <laughs> click off and go do something else. cool so when i pluck a string on this instrument you're going to hear a couple things let's see if you can hear the one i don't yeah. know if that comes yeah, through sure. yeah so all that is is the sound of the string vibrating this wood mm -hmm. based on how i've attached it to key points yeah you know, stiffer wood vibrates harder that sort of thing um, for electrical, uh, the, the pickups that we hear, all it is is a magnet. Mm -hmm. And when a magnet, magnetic field is disrupted, it creates a wave. And when that wave is amplified, it creates sound. So this instrument here is built to be a test instrument for, I have one, for different pickups that I'm making out of scratch. Okay. To try and get like what's the, the best my own oh, sound. Oh, that's really cool. And so... Okay. Yeah, so if you can see the back of it, it's got all kinds of wires yeah, sure. coming out of here. These are all different test pickups that I can hook up to the amp, yep. see how it sounds, et cetera. And uh, cool. the the goal is not to make something that sounds like the bass that I already have. Right. <laughs> but something that can be uniquely different. Yet, oh, that's yet great. Playable. How cool. So, what fun. Yeah, yeah it, is, it, is a, it is a lot of fun, and I think... A lot of that was also a way to, when you're working with hey. wood, especially fine wood working, you just kind of turn the world off for a that little is, bit. That, so and that's, that's what we all need a little bit more of. Well, that was great. Thanks for the tour. Uh, an even better end to, to the, uh, a really interesting conversation. So thanks for that. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciated the opportunity. And, you know, thanks again. I, I, I warned you when you said, hey, hey you want to talk about music? I'm like, this is it's fun. This is, this is, we got. I think this is the answer. This is the answer to having fun and doing business and doing things that really matter in the world. It's just finding where you're, where you vibrate the most. And this is it. I love yeah. it. Well, that's, that's a good ending yeah. there. Cool. <laughs>
creates huge leaps in customer experience and widens their mode of differentiation in the market.